as well have asked me the meaning of life. <laughs> My primary interest in parapsychology has been for what it says about the nature of human existence, uh, particularly the nature of consciousness. And it gives a broader picture than a view that the mind is nothing but the brain and you die and that's the end of it and the like. So I'm, I've gotten way into the technical side of things at times but I really am primarily concerned with what it might mean. That's one of the reasons, for instance, that I don't ordinarily call myself a parapsychologist, because that has a very narrow connotation. I call myself a transpersonal psychologist, which gives me the license, I guess you would call it, to care about the meaning of things, right? I mean, I'm glad I have colleagues who seem to be focused only on the technical details of what it's about. And I'm glad I have some other colleagues who are more philosophers and just think about meaning. But I'm in that middle ground of I'm interested in the meaning, what it means to people, what it means for our idea of who we are. But let's keep coming back to data we can actually gather about it rather than just philosophical speculation. <laughs> The primary thing that's been challenging me lately is a chapter I've been asked to write for a book on transpersonal psychology. And I'm calling the chapter something like, Who is the Experimenter? Because we have a model in all the sciences, psychology especially, and probably in 95% of parapsychology, where you know very well who the experimenter is and what her or his influence is. And so you do double blind studies or something like that, you can eliminate those sorts of things. Partly this simplifies things, partly it makes parapsychology fit more with other sciences, and partly it's our desperate need for acceptance by mainstream science. And so we don't want to admit that once you allow for psychic connections between individuals, classic double-blind studies don't mean anything. The experimenter is part of the experiment. So I've been arguing for years with my colleagues that we can't pretend it isn't there, right? We know, for instance, right away that there are some experimenters who are psych conducive They do an ESP experiment, it works. There are others who it almost never works. So when you have any factor that's affecting things, if you want to know what's important about it, you start studying it. Every experimenter in this field should be really deeply assessed in a psychological sense, including their unconscious motivations and processes as much as possible. But once you get into that, the simple classical model of how you do science gets very hard to uphold. But I'm really frustrated writing this chapter on who is the experimenter because I can delineate the problems in detail really well, but I can't come up with a clear-cut set of answers. So maybe that's the reality for now. Well, I'm never waist deep in any one kind of research or area I'm theorizing about or something. My blessing or my curse, depends how it works out, is that I'm interested in so many different things. So usually I'm switching back and forth between a variety of different kinds of things, and that gives me a break from getting stale on something.
I've gotten inquiries from potential students for a zillion years now. My first question to them is, are you independently wealthy? If you are, it simplifies my advice. Follow your heart, get well trained, all that sort of thing. Hardly anybody can ever say yes. So my first advice is to find some respectable area to get your advanced degree in that will let you make a living and hopefully is related to parapsychological stuff that interests you. So for me, you know, there was no question. Psychology is right on. Oh dear. There's so many interesting questions. And I gotta think of one. Okay. Why have I gotten nowhere in 50 years in convincing my colleagues, who were all nice people, smart people, to recognize that we have to various degrees fears of psychic abilities, and to pretend we don't have them is not the way to keep them from having an effect on what happens in our experiments. Um, that ties in with the thing I mentioned earlier, you know, about we need to measure and calibrate the experimenter. Just because two different experimenters read the same set of instructions, they're not at all similar. Um, they may have very different effects on people. When I try to do a parapsychological experiment with a percipient, and I've also tried to get people to use the word percipient for 50 years now instead of subject, because subject brings in the whole game of the master who subjects the inferiors to manipulation, and that has psychological consequences. When I talk with a percipient, I would like to think that I'm in complete control of the psychological set I give them, but I know it's not true. Did I have a fight with my wife at breakfast that morning? Did I have a great day yesterday? Uh, is this somebody who turns me off from their appearance just the moment they walk in, or somebody that I think this is really smart? All of that is going to have subtle effects on what I do. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that I started out in graduate school training to be a clinical psychologist, but I eventually got out of it after the second year because I decided I didn't have enough of what we would now call emotional intelligence. I had the verbal intelligence. Boy, I could talk like I'm a hotshot clinician. But I knew that I was not sensitive enough to not only what clients were feeling, but often my own feelings, right? It's taken 50 years of work to begin to come up to what I think of as emotionally normal in terms of emotional intelligence. To be unaware of those things and to pretend they're not there is very frustrating for me. And to have my colleagues pretend they're not there also is very frustrating also. You know, like we've had a number of experimenters who are really, really good at bringing out Psy in their percipients. Why aren't we studying those people in detail? Right? Why aren't we studying Dean Radin, for instance, and giving him every psychological test we have? What, what is the magic thing he does? Why aren't we studying Russell Targ, who's so good at getting people to remote view really effectively and so forth? Um, why aren't we? You know, I can, I can think of ordinary psychological reasons. We're a small group of people. We're all a little nuts to want to get in a crazy field like parapsychology, which is not the way to success in life. But still, there's deeper levels of this that we're not looking at, and that I think to some degree we're afraid to look at. But that won't solve the problem.